Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see you all here. This is the uh, agenda for the City Council, Li Library Board, Housing Authority Board, and the City Council representing the Redevelopment Successor Agency, and this is a real regular meeting. And this is Thursday, October 16th at 1 o'clock, and I am Mayor Iris Smotrich. So welcome to all of you. We'll start off with our flag salute, and it will be led by our City Manager, Randy Binder. And over your heart, ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Randy. And next we will have roll call from Cindy Scott. Mayor Pro Tem Hobart? Here. Councilmember Kite? Here. Councilmember Townsend? Here. Councilmember Weil? Here. And Mayor Smotrich? Here. Thank you. So, we have a couple pre presentations, and we'd like to start off with Ted Weil from our City Council, and he's going to be presenting a certificate of appreciation to Deputy Daniel Jacks for service above and beyond the call of duty. I will do that, and I will like to ask um, Deputy Jacks and Lieutenant Shields to join me, if you would, down at the podium, please. I haven't seen you in a long time. How are you? Come on over here. There are certain is this working all right? There are certain instances that I think are extremely rewarding. We are very fortunate to have wonderful, wonderful protection in our city. Our crime rate is extremely low. Thank you to gentlemen that are standing here. They are amazing from this standpoint. They can again assist us with traffic situations. They can assist us with certain types of disturbances. But what I'm about to tell you is one of the more unusual situations. And this is where it's heartwarming to me to show the kind of dedication that we have from our Sheriff's Department. We are very, very blessed. And I'd like you to hear what Deputy Jacks did to deserve this honor. On behalf of the entire City Council of the City of Rancho Mirage, we hereby recognize and commend Rancho Mirage Police Department Deputy Daniel Jacks for service above and beyond the call of duty, for his handling of a violent young man who was hitting the family dog. Deputy Jacks had been called to the scene by the boy's mother. He calmed the situation and established a rapport with the young man. The young man told Deputy Jacks he wanted to be a baker when he grew up. Much to the mother's joy, Deputy Jacks returned to the residence two hours later with baking supplies. The positive interaction of this young man is the inestimable value of this particular Sheriff's Department. Deputy Jack's excellent service to the community is greatly appreciated by the City of Rancho Mirage, presented this second day of October 2014, and signed by Iris M. Smotrich, Mayor. And Deputy Jack's I cannot say enough about how terrific you are, the meaningful, the sensitivity, and we are so appreciative. <coughs> and sir, maybe you'd like to say a couple things on behalf of your deputy. I'd be happy to. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's actually an honor to have a deputy who's willing to go above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, you know, we're taught a lot of things in the academy, and uh, compassion is one of those things that you have in, in and of yourself, and he clearly shows that compassion and sympathy that was needed in this situation. 
And he's been back more than once to check on this young man to make sure that he is obeying his mother and not getting violent. And, uh, and it's just an honor to have him working for us. And it's an honor to have both of you here. And thank you for all of the good service that you do. Thank you. Thank you all so much. As I always say, we are so indebted to the work they do, and it's wonderful to have their work recognized. So moving on to the next presentation, this is will be done by Mike Solange, and this is a presentation regarding the 2014 Art Affair, and this is Mike Solange is our marketing and event specialist, and welcome to the podium. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and Council. I'm pleased to announce to you that the 2014 Art Affair is soon upon us, and this year's event is shaping up to be one of the best. This year's event will take place at the newly renamed Rancho Mirage Community Park, formerly known as Whitewater Park, on Saturday, November 8th and Sunday, November 9th, from 9 a.m. until 4 p.m. daily. Patrons will be able to roam the park grounds and mingle with 100 professional artists who will be on hand each day to display and sell their artwork and crafts. The community will also be treated to professional smooth jazz performances beginning each day at 1 p.m. and again at 3 p.m. Food vendors from Rancho Mirage will have available for sale a wide variety of food offerings and an array of adult libations can be found at the beer and wine garden that is provided once again by the Rancho Mirage Rotary Club. As always, free parking is provided at the river with complimentary shuttle to and from the venue. I would like now to show you the television commercial that will begin airing very soon. I hope you enjoy it and look forward to seeing all of you at the event. Thank you. Join us for the 14th annual Rancho Mirage Art Affair, November 8th and 9th. Admission is free and will feature eclectic art, smooth jazz, great wine, and yummy fare. Discover that piece you just can't live without, be it art or unique jewelry. The Rancho Mirage Art Affair is for the young and young at heart. November 8th and 9th, Rancho Mirage Community Park. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, our next presentation will be done by our own Bruce Harry, and if, while he's walking down there uh, to greet the members of our commission for the Parks and Recreation, I'll just make a little uh, information note here. Uh, the commission consists of five members who are appointed by the City Council. The commission was established in 1990 to encourage the development of a balanced system of parks which meet the active and passive recreational needs of all current and future city residents and visitors. The commission was most recently involved in the planning and design of the Rancho Mirage Community Park expansion and amphitheater <coughs> project, which we expect to be under construction in early December. And an official groundbreaking celebration will take place at the 2014 Art Affair on Saturday afternoon, November 8th at Center Stage. In addition, the Commission has played a major role in the City's annual Art Affair, which continues to grow in size and popularity every year. So, thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Madam Mayor. May I have the Commissioners come forward, please? Okay, thank you everybody. Um, it's my pleasure uh, today to introduce you the Parks and Recreation Commissioners. I'd first like to introduce our Chairwoman, Deborah Grindle. Uh, Deborah has been a member of the Commission since 2006. She has been a full-time resident of Ranch Mirage since 1993, and as a member of the Mission Hills Country Club, is an avid golfer, which I like, and has been active in her homeowners association. 
Our next commissioner is Vice Chairman Paul Hagel. Paul has been a member of the commission since 2010. Paul also served for two years on the Library Foundation Board. Paul has been a resident of Rancho Mirage since 1998 and currently serves as Executive Director of the National Association of ADA Coordinators, which is made up of professionals throughout the country making the Americans with Disabilities Act work since its formation in 1992. Thank you for that, Paul. Our next commissioner is Deborah Sarlat. Deborah joined the commission in 2004 and has been a resident of Rancho Mirage for 22 years. Deborah loves performing volunteer work during her free time and has been volunteering for the past 10 years at Eisenhower Medical Center. Deborah has served as art affair jurist for the last six years on behalf of the commission. Our next commissioner is Judy Cohn. Judy joined the commission in 2004 and has lived in Rancho Mirage for 17 years with 11 of those uh, 17 years as a full-time resident of Rancho Mirage. Originally from New Jersey, Judy was an elementary school teacher and was very involved with her community. Judy served on the Jewish Federation of the Desert, the Jewish National Fund Council, and currently serves as vice chairman of the Women's Philanthropy Foundation. Judy and her husband Marty love to collect art, and Judy has also <laughs> served as an art affair jurist for the past six years on behalf of the commission. Uh, our last and newest commissioner, Diane Rubin, was unable to be with us today. And uh, Deborah, uh, Diane, I'm sorry, has been on our commission for, this is her first year on the commission, so she's really going to enjoy uh, what we do in the commission. Um, last but not least, I'd, I'd also like to uh, give a big special thank you to my secretary, Valerie Waltower. She's also the secretary for the commission. Uh, Valerie's job is to keep us in sync and keeping us moving in the right direction, so thank you, Valerie. I'd like to now turn the microphone over to our chairwoman, Deborah, for a presentation. Thank you, Bruce. As part of the city's annual Art Affair event, a beneficiary is selected by the commission to receive a $2,000 donation from the city of Rancho Mirage to assist in the beneficiary's arts program. This year's recipient is the Braille Institute at Rancho Mirage. The Braille Institute at Rancho Mirage offers arts classes taught by community volunteers for their students through their Express Yourself program, which includes an art studio and mixed media class, which is offered to students four days a week. Through imaging and visualization, a visual memory is transfer transformed into approaching, oh, I'm bad at this, I can't see, into appreciating art and the world around the student. Media such as clay, collage, paper making, photography, basketry, jewelry design, and creative tile are explored. The class uses a variety of art materials and associated techniques for each medium to create finished art pieces. In addition, a fiber arts, knitting, and back basketry class is offered to students two days a week. This fiber arts circle brings together all skill levels to discuss designs, designers, art materials, and accessories. <coughs> Projects are selected based on... Sorry about that interest and skill levels of the students. Back basketry is considered the oldest of all crafts as we know them today. Integration and application of local and found minerals make this craft ideal for students of all skill levels. It's my pleasure on behalf of the City of Rancho Mirage to present this $2,000 check to Karen Gates, who is the volunteer service manager for the Braille Institute at Rancho Mirage. Congratulations on behalf of the commission, the city council, and the residents <coughs> of Rancho Mirage. I just want to thank you so much for honoring us with this opportunity to show the wonderful things that our students can do. Um, it's so great to be a part of Ranch Mirage, and um, I think you'll all be very impressed when you come to our booth at the Art Affair and see what we actually do at Braille. And this will definitely go a very long way for us. Um, our classes are taught all by volunteers, which I have two of our wonderful volunteers here today. I have Lexington Garrick is here and also Linda fagan Layman, And they, when they heard about this $2,000, their brains went crazy. And we already have all kinds of ideas set for next term. So thank you very much. Our students appreciate it. We appreciate it. 
and we hope you come and see what we can do at the Art Affair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much, and we know the wonderful work that the Braille Institute does, and we're so lucky to have them in our city. And also thank you so much, uh, everyone on our, our commission. Uh, you, you do a lot of work behind the scenes that most people never know about, and we're so appreciative of what you're doing. So thank you and welcome. Moving on to the next item, which will be handled by Steve Cantanea, our city attorney. This is a special item. Um, yes, Madam Mayor, uh, it came to my attention after the posting of today's agenda that the city may be exposed to some potential litigation, um, the facts and circumstances of which the potential plaintiff doesn't know about yet. And so um, I am requesting that the city council add this item to the closed session calendar pursuant to government code section 54956.9 as one potential litigation item. So moved. Second. All right. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on now to non-agenda public comments. And this is an opportunity for the public to speak on issues that are not on the agenda for a maximum of three minutes per speaker. So if there are things that you would like to come up and say, you are welcome to fill out a yellow card. Or if you don't have an opportunity to do so, you can always speak uh, just by coming up to the podium. If you will <coughs> state your name and where you reside, that would be helpful. Thank you. And the first person is Dr. John Rubain. Joan. Yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> I need new glasses. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Joan Rubain. I'm sorry, I'm hoarse. Um, I live in at 44 570 Ocotillo Drive in La Quinta. And I'm, I'm here to give a report on international classical concerts. International Classical Concerts just completed its eighth successful year at the Rancho Mirage Public Library, and we are looking forward to our ninth season this year. Last year's artists were outstanding. All concerts were sold out. Our artists included Augustin Hadlick, a gold medal winner of the prestigious Indianapolis Violin Competition, who plays on a million dollar Stradivarius, by the way. Joyce Yang, gold medalist at the Van Cliburn Piano Competition, who just played again with the New York Philharmonic Orchestra in New York. A prize-winning trio, the Hermitage. Also, a quartet from France, the Parisi, who flew in just for our series. And finally, a young cellist who won gold at the Tchaikovsky Competition at age 17. This year, our artists are of the same high quality and include one of the greatest cellists in the world, Lynn Harrell. We estimate that 1,800 people per season, per season come to the library to hear the music, many of whom then become library patrons. They frequent the restaurants and shops after the concerts, and some who come from Los Angeles or San Diego stay over in Rancho Mirage hotels and motels, and our 4 p.m. concert time makes that easy. In addition, we're proud of our outreach program, providing complimentary tickets to schools and senior centers, as well as presenting concerts whenever possible. We implemented a new program inviting any parent who brings a child um, to attend as our, to, that adult could attend as our guest so that um, a parent won't be stuck spending Saturday playing chauffeur. And as I indicated, we're looking forward to this year, our ninth year, with another outstanding lineup of artists who um, I will, you will be able to see. I'm gonna pass out our rack card so you can all see what the schedule will be. We love the library venue. It's perfect for chamber music and the beautiful Steinway Concert Grand. Good lighting, excellent acoustics. Our <coughs> audiences are treated to uh, deep blue pillows on all the chairs. We place the chairs in a semicircle around the stage, which is on the long side of the wall. We have flowers on the stage, and afterwards, patrons are invited to meet the artists and enjoy non-alcoholic beverages and little dessert treats. 
So on behalf of International Classical Concerts, we want to thank you all so much for your continuing support. We appreciate it very much, and especially to David Bryant, who makes us feel at home. I look forward to coming back to tell you about this year's season at its conclusion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joan. It's a pleasure having you here, and we're so lucky to have you in our library with your performances. Okay, any other public comments? All right, seeing none, we will close the public comment part of our meeting and move on to the City Council board member comments. Richard, did you have anything? Sure, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, as a um, city council person, we are all asked to serve on various other boards around the valley. And one of the organizations that I serve on is the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership. This is a group of public and private uh, organizations, cities, companies that are focused on economic growth in our valley. As a member of the board, I'd like to invite everyone to the 2014 Coachella Valley Annual Economic Summit, which is going to be held this year at the Marriott Desert Springs Resort and Spa in Palm Desert. The date is Thursday, October 30th. That's two weeks from today. The program begins at 11 a.m. with the exhibitor showcase, followed by lunch at noon, and then a presentation by economist Dr. John Husing. Tickets are $95 a person or $850 for a table of 10. So I'd like to invite you all to come to this year's event. Again, that's Thursday, October 30th. And for more information or tickets, you can contact the CV Economic Partnership uh, on the, the internet. So uh, show up, it should be a great meeting and we'll focus on the growth for 2015 in the Valley. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Dana, did you have? <clears throat> I'm not sure. Uh, is there a dog in the audience? <laughs> no dog yet. They're coming, they're coming. Okay. They're coming a little late. <laughs> Wait, the door is opening. Let me just see if by any, is that Lindy? That's She's got the dog. Lindy. Okay. Right. Well, I do have a comment. Well, right now I'm speaking. Why don't you wait till I finish? Okay. The dog showed up. <laughs> the dog speaks. Oh. Lindy, why don't you uh, come up here, if you would, and bring who with you? Say that again, Cassidy. No, I'm still not getting it, but. So who do we have? This is Cassidy. And he has only three legs. And he was in a shelter to be put to sleep. And we also, he also has a little sister who's blind. And he's here to tell you that Rancho Mirage needs a dog park. And also, would you please, and again, if there's more people that would understand that a dog park would enable people to adopt, if they had a place to go where they could take their dog and exercise them. Don't mind me, I ran to get here, I'm panting. Uh, that we might be able to find more homes for more animals, like Cassidy. Thank you. Tell us, uh, for anybody who would like to consider adopting, Cassidy, uh, what a beautiful dog. Um, who would they contact and uh, what phone number? Loving all animals, and if you will pass that out, we are going to be having, again, Rancho Mirage, our model city for loving animals, uh, is hosting us for super pet adoption. And we will have over 500 homeless pets at the Rancho Mirage Community Park November 13th, or November 15th and 16th, and the brochures has phone numbers and we do have a website. And as a final reminder, for those of you who have forgotten, Rancho Mirage 
is pleased to assist with the cost of adoption of a dog or cat from the animal shelter or from one of the local 501c3 groups. And we pay up to $100 on the cost of adoption, and we also cover certain costs for um, neutering and spaying uh, dogs, uh, which is the secret to eliminating the problems that we have with too many uh, animals. If they were neutered and spaded, uh, the problem would be much less acute than it is. Lindy, uh, thank you for bringing Cassidy, who is just a beautiful dog. And um, uh, how long have you had Cassidy? Actually, I am a foster failure. <laughs> I've had Cassidy for over a year, and nobody wanted him, so I thought I promised him that he, he has a home. But I have two more that look just like him at my house, except for, in truth, they're really even more beautiful because they're white. We call them the Snow Queens. And I was going to bring them today, but they just got spayed yesterday, so they weren't feeling like they wanted to go anywhere. They weren't up, weren't up to that. Well, okay, well, thank you very much. And again, a reminder that we are going to have the uh, Loving All Animals Super Pet Adoption Gala, November 15th and 16th from 10 a.m to 4 p.m. at the Rancho Mirage Community Park. One of the big deals during the course of our year, and we hope that everybody will attend. Hope to see you there. Thank you for the signs that we have in the audience to keep us all reminded. Thank you, and thank you, Lindy. As always, thank you so much, Lindy. And unfortunately, the, the uh, television cameras couldn't pick up your signs, but we appreciate seeing them. And we know it was a labor of love. Thank you. All right, moving on. Yes, moving on back to our public comments. We have a gentleman who uh, didn't have a chance to speak, so we'll op reopen public comments. And if you'd like to come down to the podium, and please limit yourself to three minutes and give us your name and place of residence. Yeah, I greatly appreciate you allowing me to do this. It's very important. Uh, my name is Thomas Allen Worthy. I go by Allen. It's my mother's maiden name. I was before you just once before. Um, you know, uh, if you recall, uh, because I choked up, you know, every time I speak about my great late father who was in the Navy, and my brother-in-law, who's a uh, former city of Atlanta police officer, my uh, patriarch uh, uncle, Douglas Allen, was in the Army in Virginia. Um, uh, I hope all of you saw this article in the Desert Sun, and I'd like to express my gratitude to the Desert Sun from September the 15th of this year, of course, uh, with this article with regard to the pawn shop owner, Sue Palm Springs, uh, and didn't just pass over the title uh, of the article, um, because the interior of the article uh, finally, at long last, gets into something that's had to be addressed, and only by addressing it will it be healed and turned over. Uh, and that is, of course, the crime and corruption of the Palm Springs Police Department. Um, these, this couple, the Nichols, whom I do not know, uh, their attorney states, uh, they have also been harassed by Palm Springs police officers who have told them to stop to, uh, that they should drop their claims against these officers and stop pursuing the money that was seized from them. And on the uh, second, the right-hand uh, uh, column, uh, the third paragraph, uh, City Attorney Doug Holland states, Holland dismissed the allegation, adding he had no reason to believe the police are harassing the Nichols. Well, I'm sorry to say that Mr. Holland is not telling the truth. He's perfectly aware of the harassment, the problem of harassment of the Palm Springs Police Department. I have been the victim of harassment of, uh, by the police with regard to crime in Palm Springs, Cathedral City, and Rancho Mirage. And uh, Mr. I've spent uh, an enormous amount of time sitting in front of City Attorney Doug Holland and describing the harassment that I have had uh, for doing what? Reporting crime in these three cities, all three, including Rancho Mirage. And that, in fact, stretches east to La Quinta because of the malfeasance of the Palm Springs police. I'm a devout, devout after this experience, Christian scientist, and I do not appreciate it. Uh, Mrs. Eddy said, those who discern Christian science 
uh, shall keep crime in check and we will patiently await its outcome. And I am asking Mr. Doug Holland to resign. Thank you. And I do appreciate your allowing my tardiness. I was on the freeway from LA. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank I you. greatly appreciate your allowing me to speak. Well, we thank I'm here just in time as a dog lover and owner. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Okay. Well, heading back, we'll close com public comments again, and we'll head back to the uh, council comments. Uh, I do. Okay, Charlie. I have, uh, are we prepared for the Ebola and Etrovirus D68? We had questions about this, so I have a little little uh, speech here that I will read. I spoke with Tom Berenger, medical health advisor at Eisenhower. Yes, they have a plan for any emergency Ebola situation, also for the antivirus D68. Riverside County Public Health Service is working with all the hospitals in Riverside County on these programs and their guidelines. Riverside also has available on their webpage all the information. Eisenhower's webpage also can answer any questions. Britt Wilson here at City Hall is in conversations with Tim on the subject of our emergency preparedness program. The Desert Sun had an in-depth story on this subject that covers it quite well and all the plans that all the hospitals have. You can go to their webpage for that story. These are the answers of the questions that I have so far. Is the desert prepared for any problem in the event of an Ebola emergency and D68? And the answer is yes, they are. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I know these are a lot of questions that a lot of people have been asking, and it's so nice to get an update. And yeah. thank you for checking out all the information from the professionals. Thank, thank you. you. Ted, is there anything you wish to say? Not at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Well, today we have a couple of extra comments, and uh, these are from staff, so I will let uh, Kim Malcolm Valenti go ahead with her report. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Did you all feel it this morning, the major earthquake? Well, staff was ready and prepared, and in conjunction with the National and California Great Shakeout Earthquake Drill, staff from City Hall and the library participated, and I'm happy to say we all made it out alive. Um, we practiced and were prepared for duck, cover, and hold. For 60 seconds, I'd like to thank Britt Wilson for leading and organizing the City Hall effort, and David Bryant and his staff over at the library. Uh, we had a little bit of fun as far as earthquake and be prepared trivia, and were able to give out some prizes, and uh, I appreciate staff's participation as well. Um, thank you, Mayor for uh, coming and observing and participating, as well as Marcia Stein, our chairperson of the EPC. She was able to observe uh, staff in action. And uh, we'll look forward to doing it again next year. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you for the report. And thank you for all the prizes. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. We made fun, in, uh, something that could be very uh, tragic uh, and that we all need to be prepared for turned out to be a, a very rewarding experience, uh, especially this morning when we're practice. So we have another comment from our Bruce Harry. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Um, I'd like to report back to the council today on two completed projects the city's been doing. Uh, first, I'm happy to report that the city's solar system received permission to operate from Southern California Edison to, beginning, to begin generating solar electricity. As of today, 60% of the City Hall's electricity is now being produced by solar power. So I just want to let everybody know we are on solar as we speak. The second uh, project is the four vehicle speed feedback signs that the City Council approved a few months back, which came as a recommendation from the City's Traffic Safety Commission, have been installed and are fully operational. The signs are located in the vicinity of the Ranch Mirage Elementary School, located in the Magnesia Falls Cove residential area. The radar speed signs were installed to alert motorists when their vehicle speed exceeds the posted speed limit by setting off a flashing strobe which draws the driver's attention to the sign and their recorded speed so the driver can reduce their speed and comply with the posted speed limit. 
We'll be sending out a letter to the Ranch Mirage Elementary School principal to make sure that this is distributed to uh, the parents uh, that are coming to and from school. This is a residential area, so we are very uh, concerned about the speeds, and we do enforce the posted speed limits, and we hope that these uh, signs will encourage motorists to obey the posted speed limit. So those uh, four are up. These are the first four that we've installed in the city, and we'll see how they work. That's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you. It's always nice to be brought up to date about the things that are going on in our city that most people are very unknowledgeable about. So it's, it's a pleasure when, when we can bring these reports uh, to our council meetings. All right, moving right ahead with our minutes. Can I have uh, a motion to approve? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second it. Okay, please cast your vote. Which minutes are we voting for? We are voting for the minutes of September 23rd, which was the special meeting, along with the October 2nd, although we can do that in two separate motions. Do you, do you have a preference, Dana? I have no preference, I just... Okay. Can they be incorporated in one motion? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, let me, let me clarify, and I'm, the motion is to approve the minutes of September 23rd, 2014, in a special meeting on October 2nd, 2014, the regular meeting. And I'll second that. Okay, please cast your vote. Okay, motion carries 5-0. And moving on to our consent calendar, and before I hand it over to Randy Binder, uh, just wanted to ask the council members if there's any items that, are there any items that want you want to pull? or if there are any items that the uh, public would like to pull. Yes, I'd like uh, item number two pulled, please. Okay. Okay, Randy, would you like to take it? Certainly, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, just a reminder that also the uh, our Sheriff's Department is going to be doing a tip a cop program at our uh, Red Robin at Dinah Shore and Monterey tonight from 5 to 9 p.m. They're volunteering their personal time to raise money for the Coachella Valley Special Olympics program. So that's tonight, Red Rob Ra Ranch Marge Red Robin, 5 to 9 p.m. First item on your consent calendar is to waive full reading of all ordinances on your consent calendar. Item number two has been pulled for discussion. Item number three is approval of final track map 36623. This is Verlaine. It's an infill project in the Tamarisk neighborhood. Uh, you'll recall that the council approved this tentative map uh, on March 20th, 2014. It consists of 17 lots. You'll also recall that an emergency access point was added uh, to allow emergency access to the Colony Mobile Home Park. Also on today's agenda will be a public hearing for the CFD and the preliminary development plan. Item number four on your consent calendar, our approval of contracts. Item number five, our demands, and we are here to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay. Why don't we go ahead and uh, have a motion to approve items one, three, four, and five. Can I have a motion? I will make a motion that we approve items two, not two, one through. One, three, four, and five. One, three, four, and five. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, please vote. Madam Mayor, do we have an item one? Oh. Why do, item one is the way full reading of ordinances introduced okay. or adopted pursuant to this agenda. Okay, okay. thank you. So it's one, three, four, and five. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Pike, could you indicate your vote? Okay, please vote. Did we already vote on that? There you go. Okay. So, consent calendar is passed. Uh, five zero. Thank you. And moving on now to the public hearings. We'll, we'll no, come back to number okay. two. Oh, I'm sorry. We'll go back to number two. Okay, thank you very much. So this is a resolution requesting the addition of an emergency medical advisor to the community 
Emergency Preparedness Commission. There are 15 commissioners. There is one medical advisor now, and this resolution, if approved by the council, would add a second medical advisor. Any questions or comments from council? And there will not be a residency requirement for the medical advisor. Right. Well, that, that's the reason, basically, that I asked the, uh, the item to be pulled. Uh, I am sure that Dr. Jaboa is more than qualified from a medical standpoint and would be a wonderful addition. Uh, what I'm questioning, of course, is the fact that, uh, that Dr. Rabola, Jaboa is not a resident of the city. And we have always had on our commissions uh, a residency requirement. And I personally have felt it's important because it gives our residents the opportunity to participate in city government. And that's what we encourage uh, all of our residents to do. Uh, so that uh, the fact that Dr. Jabola is not a resident, I don't want to set a precedent. I'm not suggesting uh, the doctor is not qualified and I commend him very much for volunteering his time. I merely want to bring up the fact that I, I, I don't want it to be viewed as a precedent setting situation. More than likely in this particular case, there was a need for an additional emergency doctor. And so therefore, there was justification to make this exception. But I feel that I wanted to reflect upon the fact that this requirement for all future commissions is not being waived and is still part of our mandate. Thank you so much, and that is very true. And Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, I think we also have one other commission with a uh, resident that's outside of Ranch Mirage, the traffic commission. We do. And I think the requirement is that the person has to either live in the city or work in the city to be qualified for a commissioner. Yes, Dr. Jabola does work at Eisenhower, and uh, he's young and energetic, and he has changed his schedule to make sure that he can attend meetings on a more regular basis. That's uh, his stand on it. And don't forget about doctors across borders or something like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so there's something to be said for it. I think it's a good idea that we take any competent doctor that wants to assist us. And, um, but I subscribe yes. to your concern, Ted, that uh, we don't want to look to make that a habit, but under the circumstances, I think we should <coughs> support this uh, resolution. Okay, thank you. And uh, yes, uh, the doctor had come very highly, highly recommended and the person uh, Dr. David Tang, who is presently our medical advisor, uh, serves in a variety of capacities, including the emergency department over at Eisenhower. So both of these gentlemen, and he's also uh, a police uh, a reserve officer. So they both bring different elements to our emergency preparedness commission, and we thought it would be appropriate to be able to make an exception this time. But I also want to add that on our um, um, architectural review board, we have a few members of that commission that are not residents of Rancho Mirage. So um, there are exceptions. That's quite right, and we wouldn't have an, emer a, a, an architectural review board uh, much substance without some of the people who are from other areas. Exactly. So sometimes we do have to make exceptions, and I, I think when it's to the benefit of the commission and to the mm. city and our residents, I think that these are the exceptions that sometimes come up that we deal with. So thank you so much, and thank you for your comment. All right. Uh, Based upon that, I'll make a motion that the City Council adopt a resolution adding an additional emergency medical advisor to the Communi Community Emergency Preparedness Commission. I'll second that. Please vote. The motion passes 5-0. Thank you so much. So moving on to the public hearings. Item number six, 
Randy, would you like to tell us? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Item number six, staff is recommending a continuance to your November 6th council meeting. This is Todd Blue's appeal of the Planning Commission's denial of a substandard uh, setback uh, tennis, um, basketball court, sports court that was installed without benefit of permits. Ran Randy, yes. if there's nobody here to debate, discuss the subject, why don't we just, I'll move to continue it. Okay, thank you. Mm, I have a question. Uh, no, no debate, but uh, can we know what the status of this uh, meeting is at this point? It's been going on for a month now, and I don't see any reason to extend it if the first the month has uh, gone by and nothing's been done. Um, our planning manager, Bud Kopp, met with the Homeowners Association and Mr. Blue, um, I think on Wednesday and uh, they were working on a uh, compromise resolution. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll second Dana's motion. Okay, please vote. <laughs> motion carries 5-0. Thank you again. And moving on to item number seven, and this is something Bud Cobb, our planning manager, is going to address. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the council. The purpose of this request is to consider development of approximately three acres on the northwest corner of a 52-acre city-owned parcel. The proposed project consists of public park improvements that include a dog park, play area, exercise lawn, berming, landscaping, walking trails, parking lot, and street frontage improvements along Via Vale and Key Largo Avenue. As you may recall, back in July of 2012, the City Council held a workshop to discuss potential improvements to the Whitewater Park project, now known as Rancho Mirage Community Park, that would include numerous amenities, including a dog park. When the Whitewater Park plan was considered by the City Council in October of 2013, it was determined that the proposed dog park was too small and it was removed from the project with direction that an alternative location be sought. The City Council conducted a study session on in, in April of this year, and at that meeting, staff discussed various sites and recommended that the city-owned property in Section 30 behind Monterey Marketplace was the most suitable location and was already zoned appropriately for such use. The City Council at the time liked the location but did have express some concerns about proximity of the park to the nearest residences. Several meetings occurred after the study session with the Section 30 subcommittee consisting of Mayor Pro Tem Hobart and Councilman Weil. We discussed other potential locations, desired amenities, and distance to the nearest residences, and the subcommittee concluded that the Section 30 site was the most suitable of all the locations. Shown on the screen, the property is zoned open space public park on the north half of the property and high density residential on the south half of the 52 acre city owned property. The city acquired the property in the mid 1980s and it's been zoned for public park use purposes for over 20 years. Surrounding land uses include a vacant 10 acre community commercial site to the north uh, Monterey Marketplace Phase 2, which consists of Joanne Fabric, which would be the closest building to the red dot on the screen, uh, Plumber's Furniture, and then the theater to the northeast, kind of at, uh, on an angle there. Uh, to the east is vacant open space zoning and also Monterey Marketplace Community Commercial. To the south is vacant city-owned property and high-density residential and to the west is medium density residential with the Unitarian Universalist Church on the southwest corner of Via Vale set back from Key Largo over 420 feet. To the northwest is Key Largo Estates with 59 dwelling units. I've put together a photo essay showing the site and the vicinity. This is the nearest home in Key Largo Estates at the northwest corner of the intersection. This is looking from Key Largo Estates towards the city-owned property and the church on the opposite side of Via Vale. This slide looks east where Via Vale would be extended and the park property is located uh, towards the right of the stop sign shown on the screen. 
This slide shows Key Largo Avenue looking north towards Dinah Shore from the location where the entrance of the parking lot to the proposed park would be located. And full frontage improvements would be included on Key Largo as well as on Via Vale, uh, which would include sidewalks and landscaping. This is actually the church right across the street on uh, Key Largo. The church is situated over 420 feet back from the Key Largo uh, street, and the church parking lot is about 200 feet away. You can kind of barely see it through the native vegetation shown on the screen. Uh, this slide shows the approximate width of the buffer strip, and I'll go through this uh, in just a second when I show you the proposed site plan of the park. But this buffer strip would be between the dog park and Key Largo, and it would contain trees and eight foot tall berms. For reference, the bush in the center of this picture here is between five and six feet tall. So if we do uh, include berms in the project, the berms would actually be rolling and would actually exceed the height of this bush and uh, effectively screen the project from Key Largo. And in addition to the proposed under canopy of shrubs, there would also be taller trees for screening as well. This slide is taken from the small dog park location looking towards Key Largo. And you can note the eight to 10 foot grade difference between the site and Key Largo. In developing the preliminary site plan, the subcommittee advised staff to create a large buffer between Key Largo and the proposed dog park and also to add some pedestrian amenities. To address this concern, great care has been taken in the development of the preliminary site plan to increase the width of the landscape buffer to fully screen the facility from Key Largo Avenue, as I showed on the last slide, and to also decrease the elevation of the park eight feet below the top of the berm. As a result of comments made at the early study session, the dog park was shifted towards the east along Via Vale and is about a football field's distance away from the nearest residences. Staff presented this revised site plan to the subcommittee on July 22nd, and the site plan was forwarded to the Planning Commission for consideration on September 18th. This proposed site plan, as shown on the screen, shows Key Largo and Via Vale improvements across the project frontage, which will include a meandering sidewalk in the Yosemite brown color. A parking lot on the south end of the site contains 25 parking spaces accessed from Key Largo, approximately across from the driveway to the Universalist Unitarian Church. An open space recreational buffer is provided between Key Largo Avenue and the proposed dog park. Again, it does consist of eight foot tall berms, boulder outcrops, and water efficient trees and landscaping. This open space buffer will also have walking trails, an exercise lawn, and a play area. The dog park is approximately 64,000 square feet, and it's divided into a section for large dogs and a section for small dogs, each with a separate entry. Proposed amenities within the dog park include a shade structure in each side of the park, park benches, dog bag dispensers, trash cans, drinking fountains, guzzlers, bollard lights, and low wattage landscape uplight for trees. Tubular steel fencing will be used as a surround, and mow curbs will be strategically placed to prevent digging, runoff, and ease of maintenance for the park. Landscaping in the overall park plan will include a combination of 24-inch and 36-inch box trees that are water efficient and also wind tolerant, and the exact species will be determined in a final development plan. Approximately 56,000 square feet of dog park area and 2,000 square feet of exercise lawn will be turf, although this figure may change, uh, it may slightly decrease in the final development plan. The remaining area will be trees, decomposed granite, shrubs, vines, and water efficient ground cover. This slide's taken from the proposed dog park location and shows Monterey Marketplace to the north of the park with Joanne Fabrics being the closest building and the theater is located in the center of the slide. The Monterey Marketplace sits about 10 to 15 feet lower than the subject property and there's a stabilized berm between the two sites. This slide is taken from along the frontage of the dog park looking towards Via Vale and to the northwest of the site you can see Key Largo Estates the grade gently decreases from west to east about 10 feet, so the proposed site is about 10 feet lower than Key Largo. 
And uh, within this site, again, there will be eight-foot berms provided for visual relief and noise mitigation. And trees and shrubs will offer further screening and aesthetic upgrades. Uh, the Section 30 circulation plan stipulates that the project site will take access from Key Largo and Via Vale, and these streets will be extended accordingly to serve the site. It's estimated that uh, the dog park, uh, the overall park improvements, would generate a total of 25 peak hour trips. That would be 12.5 in, 12.5 out. That's an average. And if for comparative purposes, the traffic generated by this proposed park would be about one third of the trips generated by Key Largo Estates. So it is uh, a fairly light, and it's a fairly light use, say, compared to, say, a higher density residential zone. As discussed in the staff report, it's expected that vehicle miles traveled will decrease since this facility will be closer to the majority of residents in Rancho Mirage compared to parks in Palm Desert or Palm Springs. The initial study determined that the impact of a dog park on traffic and street circulation is less than significant. Regarding fiscal analysis, the park would be funded with development impact fees and license tax. These are considered local funds and no state or federal funding is proposed. During the September 18th Planning Commission public hearing, several residents uh, spoke in opposition of the project due to close proximity of the park to the nearest dwelling units, and homeowners were also concerned about potential crime problems, operational issues, and use of the facility by non-residents. Following commission discussion, the commission voted to continue the item to November 9th and requested that staff coordinate a meeting between the Planning Commission and the Section 30 subcommittee. That request was taken into consideration and it was ultimately recommended that the commission review and review the project and through its own independent analysis make a recommendation to the council. At the October 9th uh, continued hearing, the commission reopened the public comment portion of the meeting and several residents made similar comments at, that they did at the first meeting re related to proximity to nearest residences odor, traffic, wind, noise, and some residents question the need for the dog park and the cost of improvements and ongoing maintenance costs. Uh, Commissioner Bradovsky pointed out that many of the residents' concerns would be applicable regardless of the location of the facility, such as noise, odor, and uh, maintenance cost issues. Staff also explained that the rules and regulations Staff also explained that rules and regulations would be established for the use of the park, which would address many of the neighbors uh, and residents' concerns, such as dealing with off-leash dogs outside the park, the use of the park by non-residents, non-vaccinated dogs, and regular maintenance schedule and hours of use, those sorts of issues. Following commissioner comments, the Planning Commission on a 4-0 vote recommended to the City Council filing the mitigated negative declaration and recommended approval of the preliminary development plan subject to the conditions of approval and based on the findings and content in your staff report. The Commission further uh, stated uh, that consideration should be given to public and commissioner comments related to the location and final design as listed in your staff report. If the Council agrees with the Planning Commission recommendation, Staff will continue to work with the subcommittee throughout the final design process and will consider these design and regulatory suggestions. The final design, of course, will be brought back to City Council for approval prior to going out to bid. That concludes my staff report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Bud, Thank what you. kind of hours are you looking at? I beg your pardon? What kind of hours? Are you looking at this will be open? The, uh, yet, the, use, the use of the park, um, it, w the city has not established uh, guidelines for uh, the use of the park. That would be discussed, I'm sure, pro perhaps at a an upcoming council workshop where the, the bylaws and rules and regulations would be established. Would it be limited just to Rancho Mirage residents? Uh, we, we don't have any proposal on the table at this time. We would uh, just want to discuss that with council. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Richard? Uh, <coughs> excuse me, Bud. Um, in the beginning of your discussion, you mentioned that uh, the planning commission or the subcommittee had moved the park further east. Uh, was that done prior to... Uh, the public hearing, or was that movement made after 
a comment about the location of the park? Initially, the park, the dog park was planned right at the corner of the intersection of Key Largo and Via Vale. At the April 17th council workshop, uh, it was discussed that uh, it may be a little bit too close to the nearest residences, and as staff worked with uh, the subcommittee, uh, it was recommended that we shifted at least a football field's distance away from the nearest residences. So uh, the original site plan the council saw was in April. That was modified to create a larger buffer, and the subcommittee then recommended that to the planning commission. So the, the uh, people who testified, or the residents, were aware of this move for further east? Uh, yes, what you're seeing before you this afternoon is what went to the Planning Commission during public hearing. Okay, thank you. And the majority of that uh, land, the 52 acres, is really slated for a big park, is it not? A tennis uh, and approximately half, 25 acres is slated for open space, public park, and has been zoned that way for over 20 years. Okay. Dana, did you have any comments? <coughs> no. No. Ted, any comments from you? All right. Well, we'll open it up to public comments, so if there's anyone that wishes to speak, you can always fill out a yellow card. I only have one yellow card at this point, and it is from Ron Sherrill, who lives in Rancho Mirage. My name is Ron Sherrill. I live in Rancho Mirage, Madam Mayor members of city council. As most of you who know me know, I rank right up there at the top of the residents in this community who are among the greatest dog lovers and animal lovers uh, in the community, J just behind uh, Councilman Hobart and Lindy. Um, so I'm 100% in favor of the dog park, of course. Uh, and, and I really want to just commend the council for the continuing efforts to, to do things in f to, that favor the community. It's a demonstration of your commitment to put the community at the top of your priority list, and I appreciate it as a resident. And, and I, the only thing I would hope is that somehow you'd be able to separate the children playing in the park from the dogs. We wouldn't want any of the dogs to get bitten by any of the children. It would just create a, 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 a nightmare. <laughs> so just thank you. I just wanted to thank you for your consideration of the project. I, I approve of it 100%. Thank, thank you. you so much, and thank you for your comments. Anyone else in the audience have a comment? We see a gentleman coming down. Good afternoon. Would you come to the podium? And can you come to the podium and speak into the microphone and tell us your name and where you reside? OK. Uh. My name is Michael Haronis, residing at 746 Wall Street, Arcadia, California, 91007. Can you do me a favor and please spell your name? H-A-R-O-N-I-S. How do you do, Good, you? Mr. Binder? <laughs> We're going a long way before an accession. Okay. <laughs> uh, if I'm out of order, please let me know. I'm here to respectfully request the road, the width of the road on uh, Key Largo. Key Largo st begins at uh, Dinosaur and ends at the corner of my property, which is about less than a mile long. The width of the road is presently 88 feet wide. My request is to, for the planning department or whoever to reduce that width of the road to the next uh, smaller size. It does not go through to Ginger Rogers any longer. It turns at the corner of my property, which is zero, uh, 685 And Mr. Binder is well aware of it. And we're going a long way 
Randy, <laughs> Randy, could I ask you? If yeah, you send me, to, you send me to the dog, Mr. Haroni, and I'm getting a dog park. <laughs> Can you, um, uh, the next time the subcommittee meets, could you lay out what his specific issues are? and why, and uh, so that we can consider whatever it is. I'm not fully understanding yeah, what, what yes, he's talking about. Yes, absolutely, we can talk about it. Uh, Mr. Hironis will talk about it at a uh, future council subcommittee, and I'll get back to you on that. Basically, he's got about a two-acre parcel, and uh, if we kept it at 88 feet wide, he'd have to dedicate 44 feet of that. And his request is, since the street doesn't go all the way through down to Gerald Ford anymore, perhaps we don't need a street that wide, and maybe it could be 60 feet wide, in which That's case right. he would only dedicate 30 okay. feet and have more buildable area. That's his point. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. That's the best news I've ever had since a long, long, long time. <laughs> maybe 20 years? Probably. <laughs> 84. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any other comments from the audience? Well, we'll close public comments now and see about making a motion. Well, I would, I would like to make the motion if I could. I just, I just want to make one comment that with respect to the restrooms, I know, I know that the, uh, the Planning uh, Commission uh, raised that as an issue. I think that's one we're going to have to look at and make a decision. If we do have restrooms, we've got to absolutely guarantee that there's no room for loitering. They're locked early. Whenever the park closes, uh, anyway, we'll have to look into those issues. Uh, we're aware of them, and I just wanted people to know that. Uh, uh, Madam Chairman, I would move that um, we file a mitigated negative declaration of environmental impact based on environmental assessment, case uh, EA 140008, and second, approve the preliminary development plan, case number PDP 14006, subject to the conditions of approval and based on the findings and content of the staff report. And I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Please cast your vote. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you so much. I'd and like to make one more comment about the dog park. Is it, is it too late? Well, the hearing is now closed. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. We'll be back again, though, next month. So we would welcome you coming back. Okay. Moving on to item number eight. And this is going to be presented by Gru Greg Truesdell, our associate planner. Thank you, Madam Mayor. He called in sick today. I'll handle this. This is the uh, Verlaine project that we, that the city council just adopted the, or approved the final map for. Uh, this is a um, proposal for a preliminary development plan on 6.8 acres. 17 houses are proposed. Surrounding uses are low and medium density residential, and this is, I think, one of the last infill lots in the Tamarisk neighborhood. The lots are uh, 12 to 25,000 square feet. Minimum lot size in the RL3 zone is 10,000 square feet. There are three floor plans that are proposed for this project. They range in size from 3,200 to 4,000 square feet, and there's a balanced mix of units, as you can see on the right side here. These are all single-story homes, desert architecture, 18-foot tall maximum. Uh, I think there's three different elevations for each of the three floor plans. There's a mix of front and side-loaded garages, uh, covered back patios that are integrated architecturally into the roof element. Uh, you can see on this particular floor plan, the entry courtyard see, uh, looks through the great room into the backyard. The ARB looked at this project several times in July and August of this year and requested uh, um, solar protection on the windows for the south, west, and east facing windows to reduce uh, heat gain. The applicant complied, came back, and did the redesign. So we have solar protection and it adds architectural interest to the uh, 
other elevations. You'll recall that during the tentative track map discussion, it was requested by Colony Mobile Home Park to maintain a pedestrian emergency access into the project site. The applicant actually reduced the number of lots from 18 to 17 and added a 15 foot wide pedestrian access. This is a blow up of that area that shows the sidewalk in the middle of it and the uh, condition for inorganic ground cover on either side of it. And um, there'll be a gate on the north side and possibly a gate on the south side and Colony will have access through that gate. This is a blow up of the landscape entrance uh, to the to Verlaine from Sunny Lane. It's a non-gated community. There are uh, stormwater retention basins in the public parkway. Uh, we know from the recent storms that it's important to properly size the retention basins and these are sized for the 100 year storm with a safety factor of two. There's a condition that requires a couple of more trees in the landscape parkway. This is a blow up of the model home complex. Excuse me, you can see where the three model homes go. This is a blow up of that area that's a temporary parking lot. Temporary use permit would be required for the model home complex. And uh, there's um, colored pavement that's included and the project exceeds required setbacks and is lower than the maximum lot coverage allowed. This is a streetscape view of the three model um, homes. They're all uh, single story, attractive design, well architecturally articulated, and they are complementary to the surrounding neighborhood. Staff is recommending uh, approval subject to the content and findings and conditions in the staff report. We would like to add two conditions, please. One would be under the public works heading that would state that the pad heights shall be restored within one half of a foot to that which was approved with the tentative track map. And under the planning heading, added condition for lots 16 and 17, the applicant may propose additional an additional garage and or casita or bedroom uh, as these lots are larger and that those would be approved at staff level. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Randy. Any questions or comments, Dana? Uh, one question. R Randy, that photograph that was up there a moment ago, I must have missed it. Uh, are some of these homes planned to be one bedroom homes? No. I just saw something no. that said one bedroom. What, what was it that was up on the screen? Mm. Yeah, that doesn't refer to the number of bedrooms. That's the plan. So it was plan that's number one. Just the streetscape view from one bedroom, is that what that means? No, that's the plan. That's the plan. Plan number one of, of the three floor plans. The uh, uh, one B it refers to. It's plan number one, and it's a reserve reverse of the elevation. That's what that means. So one is uh, floor plan one, mm -hmm. 3,200 square feet. The two B R is not bedroom. It's it's a plan number two that's about 3,600 square feet, and then three is plan three at 4,000 square feet. Thank you. Another question, Randy, on page eight dash nine. Uh, it says lot coverage maximum allowed 30 percent, and uh, we have uh, the applicant oh. proposed from 17.94 percent to 30.49. How and why are we exceeding the 30% maximum allowed? I notice there's some talk here about rounding down, but it still is, exceeds it, and I'm wondering why. That's past practice. Past pra practice is <coughs> to allow it to be rounded down if it's 3.49. If it's 3. Point, I mean, 30.5, then it wouldn't meet the requirement. How many uh, residents are in the category of 30.0 or higher of uh, lot coverage? I don't know. Bud, do you know? Uh, yeah, probably, how about be, we ask the applicant the, when he comes up? It's in, it's in the exhibit booklet contained on page 7. And... Uh, Yep, okay. 
Well, why don't we ask the applicant to come up? Well, not yet. More, more than half are about 30.4 so, four something. I counted 11. I think the salient point, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. Mayor Pro Tem, is that uh, none of them actually hit the 31 mark. Um, they're all a Apparently fraction. none of them hit the 30.5 mark either. Right. I notice that there's one, two, three, four, five, six at 30.49, but That's Randy, the, is that? So they can round down. Yeah. I guess Mario knows uh, how to add and subtract. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> is you're saying this is something common that this is not a unique situation? I mean, like, I, I wouldn't why, say it's why common. Are we, why is this the circumstance? Can staff tell me the answer to that? Well, I can tell you that we have um, made an interpretation that 3.49 percent, or 30.49 percent 30 equals the 30 percent is consistent with the 30 percent lot coverage. We have. Um, recommended that for approval in the past and the council has approved that in the past for how uh, for how many years has that been our policy long Fif time 15 or 20. okay the other uh, the other question i had uh, madam chair is um randy on the page you, i'm sorry to interrupt but it's important that um, from, from a uh, setback standpoint, as long as the setbacks are met, that building envelope can be 30.49%. If it was a setback issue, then that wouldn't be <clears> recommended <throat> right, wouldn't, for approval. You wouldn't permit that, okay. Um, on 8-19, there's condition number 12. It says vehicle access gates shall not be permitted on Ver Verlaine Drive. Um, does that mean that there cannot be gates at the Ends, ends of the, the ends of the street, the two ends of it? Right, exactly. And that's a permanent condition that can't be changed? That's correct, yes. We, we did that specifically because that area was judged to be more open in the future. Right, I know. I, I remember, I just, I remember talking to Mario about it. And that was your, your motion, really. Yeah, right. No, no, I just want to make sure that it's in cement. Yes. <laughs> it is in cement. Yes. Because that's not a gated community. It's not a gated community, and it's not designed to be. There's no vehicle turnaround, so if the future homeowners <coughs> came back to ask to, to have it gated, we would recommend um, right. denial of that because there, it's not designed for gated. Okay, and then the other question that I had, uh, do, do any of the houses that are on Sunny Lane. Do any of them back onto Sunny Lane or do they all front onto Sunny Lane? None of them back or front onto Sunny Lane. There's two houses that would side onto Sunny Lane. Okay. You want to look at the site plan? Yeah. So you can see Sunny Lane, the main access point, and you can see the driveways of those two homes. There's a plan right. two and a plan one take access from that road. There is a uh, six foot tall perimeter wall along Sunny Lane, so neither of those lots take access from Sunny Lane. Okay. And the, um, the Fox homes just immediately to the uh, west, uh, they're roughly the same, is that correct? I think they're yes. side? Yes, it's the same, same design. That was a, uh, that was a uh, Hal Heck project. Okay, thank you, I have no other questions. Randy, the existing uh, retention basin would go along with the original program when they were building out originally, right? So it's efficient. Yes, that's right, Councilman. They're actually upgrading that retention basin and, and park. Okay. Richard, do you have a comment? Uh, just a brief question regarding the drainage bud. You could look at uh, the uh, plan uh, item number seven, the PowerPoint number seven. Regarding the stormwater pipe, uh, does that uh, have some sort of a, 
uh, care, uh, cover on it? Is it buried? And how does it come out onto the street? The storm drain uh, easement, uh, the, the storm drain is buried, and there is compacted decomposed granite within the storm drain easement and a uh, concrete sidewalk down the center. Yeah, it's a buried pipe. All the way down the... Um, down the street. Yes. Down the street. Underneath the street, right. Yeah. Looking at the, um, the areas which show the planting on Sunny Lane, it looks like we have retention basins in both uh, lots. Yes. That retention basin on the right-hand side is that is anything flowing into that or is most of the drainage being uh, drained to the north and the east i think most of it's being drained to the north and east but some of the impervious surface within this track boundary will flow into those retention basins and i think those retention basins also take some of the stormwater flow from the half street of sunny lane okay as Verlaine Drive will crest as it goes up and then go back down where it comes out on, uh, on pa uh, Palm View. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Randy, can you or Bud um, explain for us what the final resolution was of the colony easement issues that we had talked about some time ago? Sure, the applicant voluntarily dropped one lot from 18 lots to 17 lots in order to create a 15-foot wide pedestrian access from the back side of the colony. Can we get a map up colony. here where, sure. we get a map up here where you could show us what? But show, show the site plan and then maybe the aerial after that. Uh, the, the first site plan, the, I think it's, yeah. Isn't so, that the gate that was originally there, right? Yeah, so that, right, see where uh, Bud just circled that? Or Sarah circled that? So that is a, that's an access point, that's a pedestrian access point from the Colony Mobile Home Park, and if this project had been built with a wall there, they wouldn't have that secondary access. So at the tentative track map stage, the council talked to the applicant, the applicant dropped a lot, and created this situation where it's a 15-foot wide pedestrian access that comes down from where they're showing there in the highlight into Verlaine Drive, and of course Verlaine will not be a gated um, street and the colony will have keys to the locks at that gate on the north side and they'll be able to use it in the event of an emergency if they need to. The, the site, the, um, this 15 foot area also as you can see doubles as a stormwater easement for a, a, a subterranean 36 inch wide pipe. That will then go down Verlaine down to Sunny Lane. And there's Has a, there, this there's been a, discussed with the colony people? They're happy with this? Yes, yes. Good. Mm -hmm. There's a condition that requires a sidewalk in there, obviously, right. hardscape. Thank you, Randy. Randy, that's a regular sidewalk with the pipe buried beneath the sidewalk, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. It's a six foot wide sidewalk. And if you will note on page eight dash two, in the uh, top paragraph, it talks about the correspondence. And the first email was from uh, Miss Kathy Buckmaster. She's the manager of the colony, who stated that she is glad to be getting the emergency only pathway through the project via the colony's back <coughs> gate. Uh, it's a, a path she mentioned pathway? That she's gonna meet, pardon me? Is it a pathway or is it for uh, like fire in ambulance or? No, confused. it's a no. it's pedestrian access. It's pedestrian. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. And that she did mention that she was going to that she had met with Mr. Gonzalez and that she was uh, hoping to meet again with him. Um, for. Which for, I think. For future. Uh, definite planning. Right. Exactly. The applicant can probably speak to that because I think they had a meeting recently. Okay. Any further questions from council? No. Okay. Good. Seeing none. Are there any questions or comments from the uh, public? 
Okay, the public hearing is now open. And uh, I, I see a friendly face coming down here. So would you state your name and where you're from? Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council Members. My name is Mario Gonzalez. Um, I'm with GHA Communities, Verlaine Ventures, LLC, the applicant. Uh, 34 Rancho Clancy Estates, Rancho Mirage. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for the earlier approval of uh, final track map 36223. Uh, as part of that approval, um, you know, there was quite a few documents that uh, we worked very closely with staff, city attorney, and, uh, and, and many departments here within the city. Um, as part of the development agreement, there was a requirement for a PDP application. Um, on uh, May, um, May 30th, we submitted our, our PDP application. On July 14th, uh, we got approval from the ARLB or ARC, and then on September 18th, we got approval from the Planning Commission. Um, I'd like to thank uh, staff and, and all the departments. This has been a, uh, a long process with this property. As Randy mentioned earlier, this was truly an infill property. We have boundaries on all side of us that we have to deal with, and uh, we have to kind of meet with what's there and, and make it work. So I really appreciate everything. I appreciate uh, Bud's initial uh, support <clears throat> and vision of uh, of this property and uh, to get it to where it is now. And of course, uh, Greg's not here today, but he's done a, a great job working with me and I wanna thank him and Randy, thank you for today, your, your, uh, your presentation here. Um, we, uh, we, uh, we're here to this last stage and we're hopeful that uh, you folks uh, will approve our project. Um, we uh, own the project since last October. Uh, we're funded with a construction loan and we're ready to go to work. We're hoping to get some of our work done before uh, the city gets uh, busy again, and um, we're hopeful after this hearing uh, where we, we prevail and we can move forward. Um, Mr. Uh, Councilman Hobart, I just want to make sure that you're clear on the percentage of coverages and, uh, um, and also with the pedestrian access. Um, I did meet with Kathy Buckmaster personally, I've met her several times, and I think she's very pleased with the pedestrian only, Councilman Townsend, uh, that's just pedestrian access as well. Um, also, uh, we're working closely with Sterling Cove, met with their board, met with their homeowner association uh, at one of their hearings, uh, was able to present, ask some questions, so I, I think we're well down the road with them. And then uh, also with, the, with some comments by uh, Councilman Townsman with regards to the retention basin, that retention basin, um, we've had some good tests since we owned the property. Last year we had a huge rain. This year we had a very large rain, which is probably you know, a, a 100, 200 year condition type of rain that we had. And uh, immediately after them rain, we uh, visited the retention basin and uh, it, was, it was very perked up perfectly. We've had percolation tests and so forth. So we're pretty happy with that. And uh, last comment for Councilman Kite on regarding the underground pipe. That is an underground pipe. That pipe goes right underground. Um, I, uh, um, we've gone through the conditions of approval. Um, we, uh, we approve everything. I, the, the two uh, changes that were made today, uh, we see we have no problem with uh, accepting those conditions, so I think they worked out really well. And uh, um, with that said, um, we just ask for your support and, and uh, thank you for all your time. And uh, if there's any questions that might be able to answer, I should would like to try to do so. Mario, what's going to be the uh, price range on these homes? Um, we um, have homes from 3,200 to just under 4,000 square feet, and right now we'll be uh, in mid twos, mid threes. Um, this is uh, some unique uh, architectural, uh, modern contemporary styles that we have. Uh, I think we have a real opportunity here to uh, fill that last little piece of land. It's in a great location, so we're, we're going to be around one, two, one, three, on average. 1.2 million? Yeah. They'll be turnkey. Most of our product, as you folks know, we, we try to enhance, you know, our, our projects with exteriors, interiors, and, you know, these will be fully amenitized properties. Um, they deserve it. Uh, it's a great opportunity here. And, of course, uh, there is no gate. We have no gate on this, and I guess it, it'll be conditioned where we'll never have a gate. So that, that's absolutely correct. And this is going to be one complete uh, unit, and not in phases. Yes, the, all the infrastructure, as I mentioned, that, uh, you know, we're very grateful to be able to get construction financing. As you know, in today's environment, it's really, really tough. And uh, um, I uh, got some great partners, and, and we put it together. And, uh, yes, we will be making the improvement at one time with the street from um, Sunny Lane as it goes north and wraps around to uh, the terminus there at Palmview. So that's absolutely right. Uh, we want to start uh, that process. 
tomorrow if we can. <laughs> but, Mario, uh, clarification yes. on the mayor's question. The, the development is not all going to be built at the same time. Uh, all of the homes. Oh, no, no, no. We'll have a model complex, as, as you've uh, seen on the slide there. We'll have uh, three fully furnished model homes. And then we, we're coming, uh, we're, we're uh, funded for three production units. So we'll come out with a model complex and then we'll have production units and hopefully, uh, you know, we'll hit the ground running and, and season's coming up and hopefully we'll get some momentum from there. But I don't think there's anyone that would go ahead and, and build all the houses at one time. Okay. All right. So you're going to be uh, building them custom homes as they are purchased. Well, um, yes, what we try to do is that when we have at least 65-70% uh, of our existing inventory, we'll start subsequent phases. So we always want to make sure that we have a, a wheelbarrow with some inventory in it, uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Any further questions or comments? Okay. Uh, only comment is that Dana and I worked closely with Mario on the original plans, and he's done a great job in meeting our requirements. And if these homes match the quality of your previous homes, it'll be a great development. Well, thank you. I also want to thank you, Mario, for working with the people of the department. That was an issue of great importance to them and to the city. And uh, I think that worked out to everybody's advantage and satisfaction. Yes, as, as was mentioned, we lost a lot, um, but uh, I think we made everybody happy. So. You may have uh, we'll, lost a lot, but think of how much you gained. <laughs> <laughs> gained yeah, a friend. <laughs> there, there's, uh, and I appreciate the earlier comments by Randy regarding uh, a couple lots that we have. We increased setbacks, as you folks know, with the existing units there. So we have some 25,000 square foot lots uh, that, it, that are adjacent to the existing Tangerine home product. And there's no sense in, 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 in taking a piece of property and not making its highest and best use. So. We, we appreciate being able to work with staff, and, and uh, we've been doing it for many years. So I think we can work those uh, situations out. Also, that slide number seven that you uh, folks seen with the pathway, it's ugly. And, um, you know, I just want to have a little flexibility. I think they, uh, they liked our landscape plan, but we don't want that to look like a bowling alley, you know, when you come around that turn. So, you know, I may may go uh, to staff a little bit and try to move some things around so it's a little more discreet. Certainly the access will be there, uh, you know, so there won't be any problem there. But I think if we could screen it a little bit where you kind of jog around, that might be helpful. So hoping to be able to do that. Okay. I also have my engineer uh, with us here today and, and uh, my partner, Steve Hyman and uh, Stuart Chellen, if you guys have any questions for them, so. Okay. Any further questions? No, Blue no. looks great. Really Thank great. You. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right, would someone like to uh, make a motion? First, it, we'll close the hearing if there are no other questions or comments from the audience. Okay. Well, any motion? Make a motion? I'll make a motion if you would like, Madam okay. Mayor. Uh, I'd like to move the filing of a mitigated negative declaration of environmental impact based on environmental assessment case number EA140008, and item number two, approval of preliminary development plan, case number PDEP14006, subject to the conditions of approval and based on the findings and content of the staff report, and recommends further consideration of commissioner and public comments summarized in this report. All right, and I will second that. One, one, one second before the vote. I'm I sorry. I think it's uh, 14 zero Yes, zero. I'm sorry. Scratch all that. Just that was over. the dog park. We did that again. <laughs> Do you want that one also approved? Mario, you want the dog park <laughs> or? Uh, okay, we'll, uh, we'll do it right this time, okay? Consider <laughs> the approved preliminary development permit case PDP14003, subject to the conditions of approval and based on the findings and content of this staff report. All right, now I will make it. Now, do you want to add um, the uh, recommendations of the city manager regarding the pad height and the changes on lots 16 and 17 as part of that motion? You want to go ahead with that, Richard, and add that's, that to that's your okay, motion? Yes. Okay. W will they? Will those things occur without uh, it being added to the motion, uh, Randy or Steve? No, I think that should be added to the motion because they are two new conditions of approval. 
Okay, would you, would you describe each of the two conditions and then Richard can just adopt it? Sure. So the two conditions to be added, one would be under the planning heading and it would say for lot 16 and 17, the applicant may propose an additional garage and or casita and or bedroom to be approved at staff level. And under the public works heading, a condition would be added that states the pad heights shall be restored within one half of a foot to that which was approved with the tentative track map. Okay. I'll so second add that motion. Okay. I'll second that motion. That's All good. Right. Please vote. Motion carries 5 0. Thank you. And moving on now to item number 9. And this is uh, regarding the zoning text amendment, and Bud Cop will be handling that. Thank you. I don't have a PowerPoint presentation to show you a picture of the zoning ordinance today, but uh, this uh, this is a, an item that was brought to our attention uh, back back in November 2005. The city council adopted the city's general plan, and included within the general plan is the land use element which provides a comprehensive plan for the general allocation and distribution of land uses throughout the city. The land use element serves as a statement of standards, targets of population density, and building intensity for the city. The general plan establishes minimum densities, but the Rancho Mirage zoning ordinance is the primary tool for implementing the general plan. Zoning sets forth specific development standards for each parcel, including lot sizes, which is the subject of this particular ordinance amendment. When the general plan was adopted in 2005, some residential land use categories had decreases in density, such as the RM, medium density residential zone, going from five dwelling units to four dwelling units per acre. At the time, it was discussed that lot sizes should be reasonably commensurate with the maximum density permitted. However, following the general plan update in 2005, the zoning ordinance minimum lot sizes were never updated. This proposed zoning text amendment was initiated by the planning division staff after meeting and conferring with the section 30 subcommittee consisting of Mayor Pro Tem Hobart and Councilman Weil. The proposed amendment does not change the density in any zone. It merely identifies minimum parcel size in certain zones or certain residential zones, which is already consistent with the adopted general plan. If this, is, if this proposed ordinance is adopted today, or first reading adopted today, uh, the proposed ordinance would increase the minimum parcel size for four particular residential zoning districts. The RH, high density residential zone, would increase from 7,000 to 8,000 square feet. The RM, medium density residential, would increase from 8,000 to 10,000 square feet. The RL3, low density residential zone, would increase from 10,000 to 12,000 square feet. And the RL2, very low density residential, would increase from 15,000 to 18,000 square feet. Staff recommends approval of this proposed ordinance amendment, and we recommend that an exemption from CEQA under general rule requirements uh, would be appropriate, and we recommend introducing the attached ordinance for ZTA 14002 based on the findings and content in the staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Bud. All right, any questions or comments from council? I have a question, if, uh, if I may. Sure. <laughs> Randy, uh, I, pre I appreciate um, this kind of bringing us up to speed for some mistakes that I think I uh, led the making of back in uh, 2005 when we uh, decreased the number of homes uh, in residential in the residential zone medium density uh, we reduced it from five homes to four to give more space and uh, in those days I don't think I knew uh, enough uh, about the need to increase both the, make the change that I just mentioned and then increase the lot size to correspond with that. Uh, since this has been on the, um, uh, on the agenda for us, the thought has been going through my mind with respect to RH residential high density. Uh, I had always thought for all these years 
I always thought that that was essentially uh, apartment or condo type uh, dwelling units that we were talking about. Uh, this still leaves residential high density, unless we limit this to apartments or condominiums, uh, this will still leave it available for developers to come in and build single family residence, uh, residences on 78,000 square foot lots, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. And, and, and I don't think, I think that the, the council ought to discuss that a little bit. I personally think that that high density, higher density should be reserved for apartments and uh, where we do want high density in, in given areas. Mm -hmm. um, the, I, I'm still, I still have the vision of uh, a lot of homes into a, packed into a small uh, number of acres. Mm -hmm. And um, based on what I've said, is there anything about it that's just patently absurd? Uh, it wouldn't be the first time I've made a patently absurd comment, I know. But I'd like to know why that's not a good idea. And it, if it requires a study session or something for us to discuss it, so be it, and we can continue the matter. I would like to see you approve this today, and we can take that issue up. You know, we have a uh, joint study session between the Planning Com Commission and Council scheduled next week on Wednesday, and I think it's a good discussion item to have there. The 8,000 square foot minimum lot size, if uh, someone was to do single family residential in a high density zone, would necessarily keep it at around four or five dwelling units per acre, 43, 560 divided by 8,000. So that would keep the densities low. Um, condominiums and apartments, that's what the zone is intended for, but the city is also, the purpose of the, uh, of the land use element in the general plan talks about low density, low rise development, and single family homes in a high density zone would be lower development, lower density development than if we required them to be condominiums or apartments or some, side, some type of uh, attached housing product. So I would, I would be for keeping single family homes as a permitted use in the high density zone because it would keep the city's overall densities lower. How many acres would we have zoned this in the city? I'm going to say there's probably two or three hundred acres in the entire city of 15,000 acres. I, I don't know off the top of my head. It's a couple hundred acres, I'd okay. say. Well, if we approve this, to, as you say, if we approve this today, <coughs> it's a we can have a discussion uh, and change it if we want to as soon as we want to. Exactly, yes. Okay. And I would recommend we do that because basically this emanated from the meeting that we had. When we looked over the last development plan, <clears throat> we felt that it was awfully squeezed and that it was so compact that that, I think, was the genesis of us making this change and increasing the lot sizes. So I think, again, when we meet again next week, we should readdress that and come to some conclusion. Okay, does that sound good to you, Dana? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, well, would you like to uh, make a motion? Public. Public comments? Is there anyone that wishes to comment on this item? Seeing none, we'll close the public comments. Okay, okay well then I would move that we approve an, approve an exemption from the California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to General Rule 15062 based on the attached findings and introduce the attached ordinance for zoning text amendment, case number ZTA14002, amending Table 2-3 of Title 17, Zoning, to increase the minimum parcel size for the RH, RM, RL3, and RL2 residential zoning districts based on the findings and content in the staff report. I'll okay. second that. We have a motion and a second. Please cast your vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you.
All right, moving on to item number 10. And this is uh, something that's going to be talked about by Isaiah Hagerman, our finance director. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Good afternoon, members of the City Council. Uh, before I get into the presentation of my staff report, uh, just a, a clarifying item. There are actually uh, two projects with two separate resolutions to approve, so there is an A and a B action here. Uh, so what I will do is I will present my staff report over item A, return it to the Council for the public hearing and action. Uh, after that, you can return it back to me for item B. I will then present my staff report over item B and again, open the public hearing and Council action. So for item number A, this is uh, uh, the three findings and determinations over the Rancho Mirage Public Library Expansion and Rehabilitation Project. Pursuant to Health and Safety Code Section 33445, prior to using excess bond proceeds to pay all or part of the value of a project that is publicly owned, the City Council is required to make certain determinations and findings related to the project in a public hearing. The approval of ROPS 1415A authorized the use of successor agency bond proceeds to fund the Rancho Mirage Public Library Expansion and Rehabilitation Project. The uh, attached joint resolution makes the following findings and determinations over this project. Number one, the project will benefit the project area by enhancing the visible appearance of the library and the Highway 111 corridor through the project area. Two, enhancing the long-term viability of a public facility that was previously built by the redevelopment agency. And three, improving and expanding existing library infrastructure. Finding number two, the project is consistent with the plan adopted pursuant to Health and Safety Code Section 33490. That plan is the five-year implementation plan. Finding number three, is no other means of financing the project is available to the community due to the limited resources allotted to the library. These findings were reviewed by Bond Council and also by the city's attorney's office and staff is recommending approval of the joint resolution and this concludes my presentation for item number A and I'm available for questions. Thank you, Isaiah. Any questions or comments from council? Any questions or comments from the uh, public? Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public comments. And can I have a motion? All right, I'll make a motion to adopt and approve a joint resolution 2014-SA blank and 2014 blank of the City Council of the City of Rancho Mirage acting as successor agency to the former Rancho Mirage Redevelopment Agency and the City of Rancho Mirage making certain determinations and findings relating to the expenditure of excess bond proceeds for the Rancho Mirage Public Library expansion and rehabilitation project pursuant to Health and Safety Code Section 33445. Okay. I'll second that. All right, we have a motion and a second. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you so much. And moving on, uh, item number 11 will not be considered. Uh, Madam Mayor, I uh, yes, have item have, B. That's right, we have 10B. Okay, thank you. Got to turn the page. Okay, if you uh, go to your packets, uh, there's 10A-11. The next page is 10B-1. That's uh, where the second staff report is located. And uh, this staff report deals with <coughs> the Rancho Mirage Community Park Expansion Project. And uh, this is the, the same item that uh, you just saw, just for a different project. So the approval of ROPS 1415B authorized the use of excess, excess successor agency bond proceeds to fund the Rancho Mirage Community Park Expansion Project. Uh, the attached joint resolution makes the following determinations and findings related to this project. Finding number one, the project will benefit the merged project area by one, utilizing land restricted to use as open space for the use as a public park. Two, 
providing amenities for residents of two adjacent affordable housing properties, as well as the community at large, and three, improving and expanding existing infrastructure of the public park. Finding number two, the payment of funds for the project is consistent with the plan adopted pursuant to Health and Safety Code Section 33490. And finding number three, no other means of financing the project is available due to the community due to the limited resources allotted to the Parkland Fund. These findings were also reviewed by Bond Council and the City Attorney's Office, and staff is recommending approval of the attached joint resolution, and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Any questions from Council? Seeing none. Any questions from the public? All right. Public comments not closed. Would someone like to make a motion? I will make a motion that we adopt and approve a joint resolution 2014 SA blank and 2014 blank of the City Council of the City of Rancho Mirage acting as successor agency to the former Rancho Mirage redevelopment agency and the City of Rancho Mirage making certain determinations and findings relating to the expenditure of access bond proceeds for the Rancho Mirage Community Park expansion project pursuant to Health and Safety Code Section 33445. And I will second that. So please cast your vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. And thank you, Charlie. Thank you. All right, moving on now to item number 11, and that will not be considered at this meeting, so we will move on to item number 12. And this is going to be handled by our Special Assistance Fund Contract Specialist, and this is Gloria Griego. Thank you, Madam Mayor and City Council. In 1990, the, the City Council implemented a Special Assistance Funds program to award funds to nonprofit organizations that provide special activities, programs, or services to the residents of Rancho Mirage. On December 19th, guideline modifications were approved by Council to allow more <coughs> nonprofits to apply for funding. In June <coughs> of this year, staff created a web page for the city's website, sent an e-blast to nonprofits, and issued a press release for the opening of the fiscal year 1415 SAF application process. On or before August 15th of this year, staff received 50 applications totaling $311,142. Following the receipt of applications, staff and the subcommittee members, Mayor Smotrich and Councilman Weil, met to evaluate and develop funding recommendations based on priority levels for council review. For fiscal year 1415, the program is funded at $200,000, 150,000 for SAF awards, and 50,000 for discretionary funds. This fiscal year, the subcommittee is recommending an award of funds to 30 nonprofits in the amount of $99,017, which is lower than the amount budgeted for this fiscal year. This will allow the subcommittee the opportunity to recommend funding to other nonprofits that submit requests throughout the fiscal year. The SAF award recommendations are based on the following criteria. On page two of the staff report, you will see the categories and the funding percentages. For food and shelter, the funding percentage <coughs> is 50%. For health care, seniors, and children, it's 20%. For all arts and cultural and miscellaneous, at 5%. The maximum dollar amount a nonprofit may request for food and shelter is $10,000. For health care and seniors, it's $5,000. Arts and cultural and miscellaneous is $2,500. These percentages may change in accordance with the approved budget. The amounts may also change as recommended by the subcommittee and the city council. Please refer to Exhibit B, the SAF award recommendations developed by the subcommittee. 
in the first column, this is based on the first priority level of food and shelter for a total of $41,500. This leaves a remaining balance of $33,500 for future funding requests. The second column is based on the second priority level of health care children and seniors for a total of $42,517. This leaves a remaining balance of $17,483 for future funding requests. In the third column is the third priority level of arts and cultural and miscellaneous for a total of $15,000. There is no remaining balance in this category. However, the subcommittee and city council may recommend any allowances for increased funding. In Exhibit C, you will find the past three years SAF awards and this year's recommendations. The subcommittee recommends that council award the funds and approve related contracts. I will now <coughs> turn it over to the subcommittee for comments. Mayor. Thank you, Gloria. Ted, would you like to make any comment? Uh, sure. The, uh, the, the SAF subcommittee, consisting of uh, Mayor Smotrich and myself, consider this one of the most gratifying things that we do being on the city council. Being able to, avoid, to award uh, funds to nonprofits uh, is extremely gratifying. And we take our position very seriously. We analyze not just the charity, but we look at things such as ratios. What is their overhead? Uh, what are their expenses? Do they receive an inordinate amount of national funding? What do they do from a local standpoint? How many people do they actually <coughs> treat that are Rancho Mirage residents? We look, all, we look at all of those things. We take it into consideration. And then we make as learned a decision as possible. And in this case, uh, we ended up awarding uh, a little under $100,000 out of $150,000. The idea is not to say, okay, we have a budget, let's spend it. The idea is to spend it judiciously on causes that are presented to us. And so we have allowed room for those additional causes when they do present themselves to us during the course of the year. And I will commend the mayor uh, who feels certainly as passionate about this as I do. Thank you, Ted. Good. Uh, yes, we, we definitely feel very passionate about the giving we give, and we feel very fortunate that we can give. <coughs> and uh, we realize that there are many, many organizations out there and charities that are very needy. And as Ted had said, um, we wanted to really uh, focus on the local charities that do not be benefit from national giving. So this is something that we found very, very important. And because we want to make room for future giving uh, without having to make any changes in budgetary um, entries, we wanted to leave some money left over so we could give to the future people that come in, in, with great need. So. This is something we take great pride in, and we can't commend Gloria enough for the work she does in providing the paperwork. She makes all the phone calls to people, although Ted and I have made many phone calls ourselves, and uh, Gloria follows up on everything perfectly, and it's just been a pleasure to work with uh, both Ted and Gloria. Thank you. So, are there any questions from the Okay, go ahead. Richard? Um, first of all, I want to commend you guys for the for the great job you did on putting this together and leaving some extra money to still be distributed. I'd like to uh, try and spend some of that extra money today, small amounts, but I've gone through the numbers and looked at the amounts that were given last year as compared to this year, and there are three or four charities that I would like to ask your uh, approval on 
for increasing a little bit of the current uh, donations. And those are, let me just look at Exhibit B, uh, Coachella Valley Rescue Mission, adding $2,500 to that, bringing that to 5,000. Martha's Village and Kitchen, <coughs> going from 3,000 to 5,000, increasing that by $2,000. Shelter from the storm, going from 3,500 to 5,000. So those three total about $6,000 increase. And then on the second page, I'd like to increase the amount for Animal Samaritans from 2000 to $2,500. And um, what I was looking at is basically what they requested, how much they were funded last year, and uh, what, what the request was for this year. So the total comes to about $6,500 out of the 50000 which which I believe we have in excess. I don't think anybody objects to the dollar figure. Um, I don't know whether um, you have had the opportunity to actually, which I would recommend, look at their specific applications to see what it is that they've requested and essentially what it's for and what the ratios are. I mean, I think that every one of the causes that you've mentioned are more than justifiable. Um, uh, the, the only comment I have to say is I'm pleased uh, to be able to donate to those charities and others is that when we go through the applications, we do it so carefully and we look <clears throat> at the ratios so carefully that I would hate to start a precedent that um, all of a sudden that we, that we start increasing it merely based upon the submission, but I certainly would go along with it. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, and if you feel it inappropriate to not approve it, I mean, that's fine. I was looking at the amount requested, looking at the amount we've given in the past, and tried to bring that money up a little bit to more in line, maybe 50% of what they requested, and more in line with what we've given them last year and the year before. But if you feel it's inappropriate at this time to make those changes, I mean, that's your decision, so. Yeah, what, we, what we have done, and, and I really, I would appreciate uh, my colleague, uh, Madam Mayor, to voice her opinion about this, that we try in most instances where somebody has requested a maximum amount we try to spread it out as much as possible. As you might recall, last year, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Gloria, we were able to contribute to 44 charities. And uh, that, that really was our objective. We wanted to contribute to as many as possible as opposed to maximizing uh, a few. I have absolutely no uh, no problem whatsoever uh, endorsing those that you have suggested and, and uh, uh, merely point out uh, the analysis that we go right. through in ri arriving at those decisions. Um, Mayor, you may want to comment about that as well. Thank you. And I also have no problem increasing wherever you think appropriate uh, very often people do request monies for specific programs, so we try to look at that carefully. And because we did try to sp spread it out uh, as much as possible and include as many charities <coughs> and organizations as possible, that was why we decided to kind of uh, not give out the full amount at this point, but wait to see who comes forward at a later date and uh, make those uh, donations at that time. But if you feel that this is what uh, would be appropriate, we are certainly more than anxious to go along with your suggestion. Dana? <clears throat> the only reason that I don't think this is a good idea is because 
probably at the same time or within the same 24 or 48 hour period mm -hmm. that Richard was going through the list. I went through the list. I saw some that I hoped and thought should have more, uh, a little bit more. Uh, and I remember some years ago, many years ago, uh, where we would get the recommendations of the committee and then we would we'd start going back over it. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody had changes to make. I like the idea that we've got a committee that puts in the time, does all of the paperwork, examines the issues that are relevant, and makes a recommendation that in no case uh, seems adequate compared to what the request was. What I, would, what I would like to do is I'd like to keep us from doing that sort of thing, changing it here. But what I think we ought to do too is encourage the council members to meet one at a time, to meet with the subcommittee and Gloria and to go over it and explain why they think something more should be done. And then we can come back at the next meeting or two with a supplement to take care of that. But to do it here just gives it a, an appearance that um, it makes it hard. If we, It's hard to say no to an increase because it would be hard to say no to an increase in any of them. Um, and that's why I think that the better approach is to stay with the system, but to install a program that we all are aware of, because I feel like Richard does. There's some things that I'd like to say, ah, I think maybe it should have mm -hmm. got more, or certainly as much as so-and-so and that sort of thing. But I, uh, I'd, li I'd rather restrain myself and then do it separately uh, in a meeting with the commission. I don't think that's a Brown Act violation. The commission is going to hear what we're saying. They don't have to make an agreement. They can recommend afterwards. Uh, and uh, and if, it is, if it does require some technical processes to keep it from being a Brown Act violation, because it's not intended to find agreement. It's intended to hear the arguments uh, that Richard might have or I might have or Charlie might have uh, to increase a category. Then you thank you very much, and then the commission comes back with another yeah. recommendation, and this time we live with it. Uh, that's the kind of process I see, and I think that it would not violate the Brown Act. Uh, so that's my view. I do have, uh, I agree with you, Dana, but I do have one, if you look at page 1211, under Cathedral Center, which is a senior center, which uh, has been dropped from the $10,000 due to the fact that their director left at the time and took all the paperwork with them. They now have a new director, James Martinez, who I have met with, and we are trying to get them back on the schedule. And also, there are many Ranch Mirage residents who use this center even more so than, let's say, um, Ranch, Ranch Mirage residents more so than Cathedral City residents. So this has been a proven fact. We have met with them. I met with them with Robert Barrett. Gloria and I have talked about it. I've talked about it with the mayor. And as you can see how they were dropped, it was nothing to do, that they didn't deserve it. It was due to the fact there was nobody there to present the papers to uh, enact this fund being given to them. So there's more to the story, but I can hear what you're saying. Maybe that's something we should uh, do at a later time, but I certainly would like them to be reconsidered at this time for some funding. Well, I think that's the very reason that we have left the opportunity uh, to come back again. And, and as Gloria will tell you that uh, a number of situations where we'll receive an application that's incomplete and that uh, there isn't uh, the supporting documentation that there are Rancho Mirage people being served. In this case, I can understand maybe there was a gap as a result of a change in personnel, and it very well may that that, that service is very deserving, that charity is very deserving. Uh, there's nothing sacrosanct that cannot be revisited. And so I think that's the point of 
uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hobart that, that uh, and I think it's a good idea. The subcommittee can go through their recommendations and we can meet individually so that there is no violation as far as the Brown Act is concerned and get the input because I'm sure that everybody feels passionately about something and uh, uh, we can implement that because we certainly have the time and budgetary room to do that. Good. Also, the uh, center is uh, putting in their new paperwork, I believe, what, Monday? On Monday, yes. However, I would like to make a comment regarding the Cathedral Center. Um, what um, Councilman Townsend is discussing is the fact that they were in the budget as a line item and they've been removed. So they have not applied through the SAF program because previously they were budgeted as a line item. And again, that was lack of nobody at the helm. So it just kind of fell off, fell off the end of the world. And uh, knowing that uh, we have so many residents of Rancho Mirage and clubs who use the, use the facility, which I was not aware of, and I don't think a lot of us were, with this interruption of uh, nobody speaking for them. So I now I'm speaking for them. Uh, let me make a motion that nobody doesn't, nobody has to second it. But if it works, then maybe it'll go through. What I would do is I move we approve the recommendations of the subcommittee, and immediately, and by immediately within the next week, formulate with the assistance of the city attorney a method for the subcommittee to hear the issues that have been raised today and any others that any other council member wishes to make, and that the subcommittee then come back with a supplemental report, either making some changes or not making some changes uh, within a very brief period of time. That way everybody gets their issues heard, I, I think, and uh, uh, we can have a, this way we'll have a format that we can follow year after year instead of going through the process that we're going through right now. I think that's a great idea, Dana. Okay. Yeah. Steve, Second the motion. All right. Uh, before we vote on it, Steve, did you have any comments that you wanted to make? Uh, no. Okay. Um, I will just make uh, a couple of comments because we were concerned about the Brown Act, and that's why uh, the list of uh, the awards was sent by Gloria to each of the council members asking for your opinions and if there were any changes you wish to make. So we did want to cover it that way because we can't always speak for every organization that maybe is not getting what they deserve or maybe uh, a new organizations should be added. I think what people don't realize and what I didn't realize is that very often uh, people would come before our council meeting asking for money and we would approve it and then they would never show up to fill out the, ap the applications and sometimes they wouldn't get in their completed application or get in uh, any of the subsequent uh, paperwork that was required. Uh, at one point, uh, Gloria had on her desk a stack of files probably 14 inches high of files of organizations that we had approved funding that never followed up with paperwork. She's put in probably a couple hundred hours through the year uh, following up on these people, asking them for their paperwork, asking them uh, to please come in, that the money is waiting for them and we, we want to see them benefit by our um, generosity and she has all but had to go banging on their doors to get the paperwork completed. So this is a, a process and uh, a, a commission or a, a committee, a subcommittee that has many elements involved with it. But because we were so concerned about any of the problems with the Brown Act, that's why she sent out this list and uh, was hoping that if there were changes that were required or suggested that that could be done before we got to this meeting. So I think that Dana's suggestion is a good one and I think we should implement that. 
and mm -hmm. I would like to second that. It has already been seconded, so why don't we just go ahead and vote? And just before we vote, can I make one additional comment? <clears throat> we recognize that we're not spending our money. We also recognize we're spending the tax money of the residents of Rancho Mirage. And I can tell you that over the years, we, we go through this process and we make other contributions along the way when requests are made. And I've talked to I don't know how many people over the years who uh, are tight-fisted, conservative, all of that, but they appreciate the uh, diligence that goes into our making selections for uh, donations, and they have never expressed uh, an unwillingness to for us to participate on their behalf in this process of uh, helping, assistant, helping assist local charities. And I just thought we'd make that comment. We, we all know that, and uh, it's an important thing for our residents to know that we do this in your name, not in ours. Exactly. And an additional comment, in order to make it easier for organizations to request funding, we have put the applications online. So all they need to do is fill it out wherever they are by uh, their computer and submit it. And they don't have to come into City Hall. They don't have to come before the council. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible. And uh, again, I just can't commend Gloria enough for the work that she does. So why don't we go ahead and vote on this. And uh, please cast your vote. Okay, motion carries 5-0. Madam Mayor. Yes. Clarification on the... Um, page 12-1, where we talk about the program being 200,000 and we're funding 150 and 50 is left for discretionary. Right. Is the 50 in the discretionary the amount that we are, we have not funded as of today? Correct. Correct. The 150 yeah. was to cover all the funding that we were doing up until this okay. point when the applications all came okay. in. And then the extra 50,000 was for people who did not, could not get their application in, or for some reason throughout the rest of the year uh, would have a need, and they would become come before council, or they would call one of us and say, we need to submit an application. Is there okay. still funding available? And that's if, where the discretionary money comes in. Okay, if those funds are not used at the end of the year, what happens to that money? Uh, maybe it, Isaiah can help us with that. Sure. Uh, the budget lapses at the end of the fiscal year and uh, is just retained in the general fund and uh, you're subject to the next year's appropriation limit. Okay. Thank, thank you, Isaiah. Okay. okay. Any other questions? No. All right. Public comment? Pardon me? All right. Are there any public comments at this time? I see gentleman Michael New and he's coming uh -huh. down. We have seen you here many times. I know you're, you're working with the dogs and the kids all the time, and it's wonderful. Um, Madam Mayor and Council, I just want to say I'm a recipient, Canine Friendly Visitors is a recipient of the SAF <coughs> grants. And uh, yesterday you can speak to, I mean, the grant this year enabled for the first time ever, Sunnylands yesterday hosted Canine Friendly Visitors and a very large group of disabled kids that the school district doesn't have the money for those types of field trips and our grant from last year um, enabled to pay for the transportation of those kids, the meals for those kids, and to have Sunnylands you know, open on the day that they're closed to what well, you can speak to. You were at the event. And um, today our new grant, which is, I may be a little emotional about this because I just came from this, but I was asked to Catherine Finchie Elementary School um, has medically challenged um, in the youth, they're uh, eighth grade and below, and they asked me if we could, canine friendly visitors could service those kids. I wasn't sure, that because they're so challenged, that if we could, and a child today that has, is in a wheelchair, that has prosthetic legs, that um, has a walker with wheels and two prosthetic legs, who's never, this was, today was session one, and the grant that I wrote was for Catherine Finchie, the expansion into Catherine Finchie Elementary, 
this child with Amos, who's the large, largest collie, got very, very excited, asked to get into his walker, grabbed Amos's leash, and Amos pulled him, and he did his first steps ever with his prosthetics and walked for 30 minutes with the dog. So the impact that the grants make, and thank you so much for the work that you do, because I know we've talked many times, but the impact that the grants make, we discuss it from a business, but the lives that it really touches is truly, truly amazing, and I thank you truly from the bottom of my heart and for the residents of Rancho Mirage. Thank you, Michael. It's always a pleasure having you here, and, and yesterday was one of the most touching times of my life. That was the first time, too, that those, none of those people had ever been to a museum, ever. So. And might I add that um, for the people who are not familiar with some of the, the challenges of some of the disabled children especially, uh, Michael spent countless amounts of time teaching them how to stand up. Social skills. Social skills make eye contact and shake hands with the person to whom they were speaking. And this was such a monumental experience for them, and it was a monumental experience, I'm sure, for Sunny Lands. And we thank you so much. Well, we thank you for attending. I thank the council very much. Okay. Okay. I think we've taken care of that. So moving on to item number 13. And this is going to be presented by Randy, our city manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is a request for, for Community Facilities District Number 1, Annexation Number 163, Verlaine Ventures. You looked at the final map and the PDP earlier today. There are two resolutions on your agenda. One, to adopt the boundary map for the new annexation area, and two, to set the um, public hearing for Thursday, November 20th at 1 p.m. The annexation area is about seven acres in size, 17 single-family homes, and the annual CFD revenue to the city of Ranch Mirage for this fiscal year, would, or next fiscal year, would be $6,687. Okay, thank you. Any questions or comments from council? Any questions or comments from the public? All right, public hearing now closed. Uh, just one question, Randy. Is this Melarus? <laughs> Is it a Mellow Roos yes, district? This is a Mellow Roos district, is it? Community facilities districts. Is it related at all to Mellow Roos for that? Because I don't think so. On the on page 13-3, it, it uh, discusses Mellow Roos yeah. Community Facilities Act. Yeah, it's covered by that act, but they're mm -hmm. known as community facilities districts. Okay. It's a broad act. Okay, so it really doesn't pertain Belarus does not pertain to this other than being part of the broader. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's just the name of the body of law. So we call them community facilities districts. But there's all there's different kinds of Belarus. Yeah, Belarus are actually bonds that are issued for public improvements. That that's correct, that's Councilman. Right. This is yeah. under that act, but it not is not actually a Melarus tied to a bond issue. Okay. Uh, this is a community fac facilities district, which is just a special assessment on a property <laughs> tax bill. So police and fire. Thank you. Okay. I move adoption of uh, resolution 2014 to a next in order to adopt the boundary map of CFD number one, annexation number 163, Verlaine Ventures LLC, and resolution number 2014. Next in order, to declare intent to annex the subject area to the CFD and set Thursday, November 20, 2014 at 1 p.m. as a time and place to conduct a public hearing. All right, I'll second. second. Okay, please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Just Thank like you. to just make a note that uh, a lot of our laws, the state laws are named after the assembly uh, people or the senators who get them through. So no, sometimes we get confused because there's like several brown acts, but they're not the same, same guy. Oh. So, you'll see uh, Mellow's uh, no. Mello and yeah, Roos have, have other acts named after them too. 
Is that like, have a funny name. Is that like marshmallow roos? <laughs> <laughs> okay. It could happen. It could happen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So now we'll move on to item number 14. And this will be presented by Josh Altop, our associate planner. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, fellow council members and staff. Uh, this is a periodic review of the development agreements that the City of Rancho Mirage currently has. Uh, part of section, section 1756070 uh, requires that we do this periodic review to determine if the subject property owners are in performing in good faith with the terms and conditions of the subject DA. Uh, currently, the City has seven active development agreements, and I'll go through each one and give you an update. Uh, the first one, go from oldest to newest, is the Federated Development Agreement. It was approved back in 1989 for what is now known as the Marauder Project. Uh, there's been many amendments over the years, with the most recent being Development Agreement 06001 back in 2006. Uh, this particular amendment covered the track map and the renovations of the Lodge Hotel and the Tennis Villa site. Uh, the hotels, we all know, and spa suites have been completed and were opened to the public this past May, and currently the Development Agreement is in good standing. The second one was back in 1985. It allowed a phased development of a self-storage facility, which was completed back in 1989. Uh, the Rancho Mirage self-storage complex is being properly managed and is in good compliance with the existing terms and provisions of the development agreement, and thus the DA is in good standing. Uh, the third is the Eisenhower Medical Center Development Agreement. It was adopted back in 1988, covered the 100-acre uh, EMC campus. It set a couple of precedents, the building height to be four stories or less, and that EMC pay traffic mitigation fee of $100,000. Uh, all development applications require review by the Planning Commission and City Council, and they're subject to terms and provisions of the Eisenhower Medical Center specific plan. Uh, the site is being properly managed and is in compliance and in good standings with the current development agreement. Uh, development Agreement 97002 was approved in 1998. It allowed the development of 158 vacation ownership units on just over 20 acres. Uh, it was known as the Western Vacation Club. It was a phased development completed in just over three years, which finished up in 2004. Uh, once again, the project is being professionally managed and maintained, and all the fees that are being, uh, being required to be paid are being paid. Thus, the vacation ownership project is in good standing with the requirements of their development agreement. Uh, the fifth one here is done back in 2005. The City Council approved Development Agreement 05001 and it allowed the development of 111 Plaza, and this is where the former Bing Crosby's now Spaghetti Factory and then the buildings that run across the front, just across from uh, Applebee's Caddy Corner to the river. Um, they did one amendment to their development agreement, uh, which allowed the tenants on the second floor to pay an in-lieu fee instead of the uh, sales tax because they were going to do a office use as opposed to a commercial use. This is known as Ordinance Number 860. Uh, this particular project, it has had some financial issues because it's changed hands over the years. Uh, they're six quarters behind on their payments. I know the city attorney's office is working. They sent a notice of default back on September 11th. I did get an update yesterday from the city's attorney's office. Uh, to date, they haven't had a response yet, so the city's going to take and pursue all remedies <coughs> under Title 17. And Steve can go into a little more detail if the council has any questions. Um, the six. Uh, development agreement is Stonebridge, known as Stonebridge Subdivision. It was approved back in 2006 by City Council. It averaged the track to require to have a minimum, uh, or excuse me, an average of 25,000 square feet. The map was recorded back on November 9, 2007, with a minimum lot size of 22. Uh, the required subdivision improvements were completed back in 2008, and currently everything is being maintained properly. To date, no homes have been built, and the project is in good standing. Uh, the final development agreement, we've talked about it a lot today, is the one for Verlaine. Um, it was approved earlier this year by council back in March. Uh, it required that they do the obligations from the previous track map, 31800, uh, change the land use and renaming of the street. Uh, the PDP was on today's agenda, which passed. And to date, no homes or anything have been built, but thus the project is in good standing. Um, that concludes my presentation. Uh, just to let you know, my recommendation is to move the six forward, that they're in good faith, and the second portion is to direct the city attorney's office to continue <coughs> to pursue all remedies available for the one out of compliance. And that okay. concludes. Thank you. Could you tell us how often these agreements are reviewed? We, uh, by code, we have to do it annually. So we keep an eye on them in planning. We flip through them. We make sure they're all up to speed, making sure all the contractual obligations are being met. Um, so it's an ongoing process. <clears throat> mm -hmm. We do it. We do it. Last time we had a chance to do it was in 2012. We did it in 2011. We do it fairly often. Um, a lot of times is, for example, the second one, the self-storage. It's been around for 30 years, but because there was no expiration date, they fulfilled their agreements more than 20 years ago, but thus we just have to keep it on the books and keep track of it. So most of them are all in compliance. 
Okay, thank you. Any questions from comments? I do. Is the spaghetti factory in the receivership? Does the bank own it, or what's the problem? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know. Have they been closed? I haven't heard anything lately. I haven't heard any gossip or anything. I'm not sure, to be what honest. What about the property itself? No, 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 no. There, there is an ownership. They just are not complying with the city's requirement of Ordinance 860. That is a specific fee that the city imposed on the project upon its uh, entitlement that they have to pay this in lieu fee if they have office tenants. So those are all the tenants that are in the second floor. So rather than get the money generated from a commercial tenant, the tax base, we get an in lieu fee of so much per square foot. And it's paid quarterly to the city as an offset to the money lost from having a commercial tenant. And I'd just like to point out that what the remedies we have available in that particular instance includes um, you know, we can file a civil complaint for a breach of contract and get a court order to order them to um, make those payments. We also can cite them since it's a violation of our municipal code. And we can revoke permits to prevent them from using property that's currently vacant. So we do have remedies um, available. Steve, do any of those remedies have any kind of uh, impact on the old spaghetti factory? It's going to have an impact on the property because what will likely happen is it will be able to impose a special, record a special assessment against the property for the amount of money that's owed. So it's the property owner who's ultimately responsible for paying off that assessment. So ultimately, it could have an impact, though, on the operation of the property, right? It depends on how what's in their lease. I mean, if they're if they if they have a certain amount, I mean, if their lease is a set at a certain amount, then it should not impact them, it's just the, the owner of the property. Okay. okay. Any other comments, Steve? Does that? Do they very often, when they're in a situation like this, a landowner, a property owner, do are they able to go to the tenants and uh, get assessments? Yeah, that's going to depend on what's in their lease. Okay. I would imagine that a um, um, uh, business like Spaghetti Factory has really you know, tight leases right. that won't allow assessments for things like this to be imposed on them. Okay. But typically, uh, landowners will go to tenants and ask for additional funds? Well, if they're in a, that typically happens like with homeowner associations. If the association is being fined or assessed, <laughs> they'll go after the homeowners. But I don't doubt they have a clause like that with in that complex there. Okay. That'd be too risky. Okay. okay. Well, but I also like to note that, um, you know, we don't have development agreements for all projects. In California, California is one of the um, only cities that allow um, cities to enter into um, agreements with developers. And essentially, the reason behind that is that um, it allows the cities to get something that you cannot otherwise get through your standard conditions of approval. So for instance, we will, um, you know, we'll, we'll ask for um, additional revenue, like in this particular case, in exchange for allowing them to use their property for a different purpose than permitted under the code. And so what we get, so we get something that we can't otherwise get through the normal planning process, but what the developer gets is they get certainty. So we cannot change the rules and regulations on them in within a certain time period. Right. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Any other questions or comments? Any questions or comments from the audience? All right. Closing audience comments. Uh, would someone like to make a motion? Steve, do we need both of these motions uh, separately or? Um, you, can, you can do them together. together. Okay, then I'll um, find that the council will find that the subject developer property owners are currently in compliance with the terms and conditions of the following six development agreements. Federated, Jen LB Rancho, LLC, Thomas Investments, Eisenhower Medical Center, Weston Vacation Club, Stonebridge, and Verlaine Ventures, LLC, and that the owner of the property uh, subject to Alamo Group Development Agreement is not in compliance. And item number two, direct the city attorney's office to continue to pursue 
all available remedies to bring the owner of the property subject to the alamo group development agreement into compliance and to report back to the city council on the status of the matter at its subsequent city council meeting. Okay, and I'll second that. Please vote. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you, and we will be now Recessing at the closed re session. Re and Steve will address what we're going to be doing in closed session. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so the City Council is now going to recess into closed session pursuant to Government Code Section 54956.9 to address the pending case of Veronica Juarez et al. versus the City of Rancho Mirage and the one potential litigation item we added on as an urgency item. Okay, thank you so much. Well, I think that finishes up everything for today, so we look forward to seeing everybody next time, and just have a good rest of your week. Meeting now adjourned.